My creative project involves phenomenology, in particular, how the experience of volunteer teaching in Kenya for three weeks may influence one's outlook and self-perspective. Since 2005, I've been taking high school students to Kenya for a three-week volunteer teaching program. For many, it is an eye-opening experience to a culture and lifestyle very different from their own. We work with about 10 different schools where the Americans teach a variety of subjects. Being the only Americans in a school of 300 Kenyan students and teachers can stretch the students' comfort zones. It forces them to confront the reality that they know from home and their current reality. This leads to questions of equality, resource use, opportunity, materialism, and what it means to be happy. Each day, one student is responsible for writing the daily dispatch from Kenya. This daily account of the student's experiences is sent to family and friends so they can follow our adventures. I reviewed more than 70 dispatches and selected the quotes that captured how the experience may have influenced their perspectives. Today was an eye-opener for me. This is definitely not what most visitors to Kenya experience, and I love it. Kenyan children have very few possessions, but they make do with what they have. Most often, a soccer ball is a bundle of plastic bags bound tightly with string. I saw a group of girls playing jump rope with a worn piece of twine, and boys playing hopscotch with squares etched in the hard dirt. They didn't need anything fancy to have fun, and maybe I don't either. Varun Vidj, 2008. Today we played soccer with a group of young Kenyans. I've played a lot of soccer in my life, including two state championship games, but I have never enjoyed a game more than the one I played today. From the beautiful landscape to the happy children, it was the perfect game. Each time we scored a goal, we would celebrate a quick round of high fives. My heart sank when the game was over, but I was consoled by the thought that there would be many more like this to come. Jeff Kroska, 2008. After dinner, a woman named Mama Weweru came to talk with us about the Mau Mau movement, a time in the 1950s that greatly influenced Kenya's quest for independence. So, here before us was a 74-year-old woman telling us stories in Kikuyu about Mau Mau. She was actually there. She is a primary source. There are so few people today still with us who are in those situations, who knew what really happened, and who are willing to tell their stories unfiltered. Each of us should talk with people who experienced a special event or who lived through an interesting time. There are many amongst us, here and at home, who we can learn from. We just need to ask. Carrie Kuhn, 2008. I visited the 6th and 7th graders today to talk about my life and how it compared to theirs. I started off by telling them my name and where I was from, and they took over the conversation with their questions. I was surprised at how much they knew about America. They asked about the upcoming election, gun control, and a new law in Arizona that allowed a policeman to stop a person based on their skin color. The students had some interesting images of America that I tried to address. One student heard that everyone in America carries a gun and is a millionaire. Well, I guess based on Western media, and what the rest of the world sees of America, this would be accurate. Armin Mehrabani, 2008. Our walk through the meat market was an experience like no other. The smell was awful, the ground was covered with different unidentifiable juices. There were butchers slaughtering livestock and men preparing poultry. There were buckets of chicken or fish on the ground for people to choose from, and whole cows and pigs hanging from their feet by hooks. It was definitely unlike anything I've ever seen before. This is definitely not your neighborhood Safeway. Caitlin Hicks, 2009. We have much to learn from Kenyans. Their faith in democracy is genuine, their willingness to fight for their convictions is inspiring, and their attitude about education and family is unlike anything I have witnessed previously. Most notably, we are learning that contentment is about who and not what and that today should not be sacrificed in the hope of a better tomorrow. As Mama Waweru taught us, the path will not be straight, but it is one we must follow. Prendadini, 2009. The children that I have met in Kenya appreciate the things in life that really matter. 
While drinking a steamy cup of chai, I made my own list of things that really matter to me. God, my family, mom, dad, my brothers, Andy and Chris, friends, education, helping others. I have been inspired by these children to appreciate these things and people every day to the fullest extent. This trip has unexpectedly helped put my life in perspective. Stephen Curdy, 2008. When we first walked into the narrow moral disabled children's home, I saw a young boy the size and height of my brother. One of his legs was much longer than the other, and he used crutches to get around. I tried to hide it, but it was just too hard to keep it all in, and I cried. I immediately realized that I was such a lucky person to be living in the United States and to have such a wonderful family. These children are at such a disadvantage, but through their own determination and the assistance of the home, they have a chance at a better life. I was so grateful to have this experience, and I have grown from it in many ways. Ariel Green, 2010. I can honestly say that my experience here in Kenya has strengthened me both physically and emotionally. Although in the beginning, and at some points during the trip, I wished that I could go back to my comfy life in California. However, I forced myself out of my comfort zone, forged ahead, and benefited greatly. This experience has definitely changed the way I will look at my life now and how I will look at my life in the future. Annie O'Dell, 2011. It is truly amazing how much we take our shoes for granted. The children here walk everywhere, and I mean everywhere, and the material covering their feet goes everywhere they do. There are no cars for them to ride or buses to take. Most likely, the shoes on their feet are the only pair they have. It was magical seeing their faces light up when we dumped duffel bags of shoes out in front of them. They were so excited, and for something as simple as shoes. It was so wonderful that we got to experience their joy when we knelt down in front of them asking if their shoes were mzuri, or good. Thank you, Athena, for collecting these shoes. The kids say jambo, hello, and Asante, thank you. Becca Rogers, 2012. In America, we have fences to keep the students in school. In Kenya, they have fences to keep students out of school. In America, students will try to skip class or sneak off campus. Here, there are far fewer spaces available for all the students who want to be in school, so a fence is needed to keep unregistered students out. Jenna Angel. 2013. Mama Waweru had lived through so much and seemed to embody the idea of the human spirit. Her parting words of advice was that life will have its ups and downs, but one must never give up. If one tries, his or her situation will always improve, but only if one tries. She also advised us that once we were old enough that we move out of our parents' homes and be on our own. It was fine if we visited our parents, but she stressed that when a child was ready, it was time to leave the comfort of home and take on the world's challenges independently. The positive outlook that she had gained from such a difficult life was inspiring, reminding me to keep pushing forward, even through events that seem impossible to overcome. Quinnell Bethlehem, 2013. At La Pella Orphanage, after the initial frenzy of looking at cell phones and cameras, we settled into games of soccer, duck, duck, goose, and jump rope. The children all wanted to play and also wanted our entire group to join in. I honestly think that just being around us was enjoyable to them. It was certainly enjoyable to me. The interaction that we had today is something that I will treasure forever. It gave me better perspective on how lucky I am and how that, even in less ideal situations, we can all find joy. Nancy Leslie, 2014. The most striking feature of Kenyan culture is that, despite the poverty, despite the inability to access daily amenities that we, as products of Western culture, consider mandatory, such as electricity and running water, the Kenyan people are irrefutably happy. One way this is obvious is through their music and spirituality. There is not a day that I walk into school, nor is there a classroom that I enter where I am not greeted or left with a song from my pupils. There's not a meal that goes by at school or at the neighbors that isn't accompanied by a prayer. In fact, the only thing that rivals a Kenyan's love of life is their love of God. Mason Allen, 2014. The butcher shop will forever remain in my memory.
not only because we were buying mutton and the shopkeeper laughed at the way we said it, but also because of the smell. It smelled, well, like a butchery. While I'm not at all accustomed to such a scene, this is another example of how life is more real here. The meat one eats here is not wrapped in fancy paper and placed on ice. The livestock are not shot up with hormones and the meat then processed to appeal to the consumer's eye. Here, the cow or goat grazing on the side of the road one day may be your dinner the next. This is what the Kenyans are used to, and we are used to something different. Neither good nor bad, just different. Ollie Ward, 2012. What I noticed early in my time here was that people here have very, very little. I commonly saw worn out school uniforms, tattered textbooks, shoeless children, and people living in very, very small houses, actually huts. What I didn't see was the opulence and silly electronic gadgets that have come to rule our lives in America. Despite this lack of luxury, these people are genuinely happy. The saying that money can't buy happiness is alive and well in Kenya. Time to simplify and truly appreciate what my family has done for me. Jimmy Brunner, 2013. The End.